welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the 221st episode of The Simple, Sophisticate, and welcome to our French Week, the third annual French Week of The Simply Luxurious Life, which includes the podcast here on The Simple, Sophisticate. Today, I have a guest who's joining me from Paris, who's going to talk about her transition to Paris. She just wrote a memoir that came out this past spring, and it's titled Waking Up in Paris, written by Sonia Choquette. Sonia is a spiritual advisor, teacher, and instructor known around the world. But we're, what we're going to focus on in this conversation is this, this journey she went on for two years and how, yes, she's in Paris. Paris is amazing, beautiful. We dream about Paris. Paris is still real life. And making a big jump like that, in her case, from, from Chicago, is not something that's just going to magically fix everything. And I think that's important to keep in mind, no matter wherever we wish to jump, we can definitely and should definitely pay attention to what our instincts are telling us. But we also need to have patience. And she's going to talk about what Paris has taught her, how it worked as far as building her network, her social connections, and where she's at now three years now, removed as she moved in January 2015. All right, I'm going to get right to our conversation. She's also going to share this week's petit plaisir, and then I'll join you on the other side. Here is Sonia Choquette. Joining me on the podcast today is internationally recognized author, teacher, and consultant Sonia Choquette. Her recent memoir, Waking Up in Paris, Overcoming Darkness in the City of Light, was released in April and shares with readers her two-year journey beginning in January 2015, arriving in Paris with her daughter to start a new chapter. Welcome to The Simple Sophisticate, Sonia. Thank you. I'm so excited to be with you today. (laughs) I'm happy to have you on. Um, I want to start with the question. Uh, You're a spiritual teacher and you've been one for over 30 years. Your, your, right. your new memoir reveals you practicing what you teach your students. And I think that's why I like your book so much. Even though you were in Paris, which as many of my listeners and myself acknowledge, we adore France, there were obstacles. But you walk through them and you show us how you navigate around them and through them. Could you share with listeners the inciting incident that enabled you to leap from Chicago to Paris? Well, what what invited the change, which was very dramatic and a bit unexpected, was that my marriage of 30 years, which I was intently committed to making work, didn't ultimately work out. My husband chose a different path and decided he didn't want to be married anymore, which in the longest run was a beautiful decision. But in the shortest run, blew my world apart Sure, because it grew up with him. You know, this was, I, I built a life with him. And so all of a sudden I needed such a dramatic change. I, I couldn't live in the haunted house of the past by staying in the same city, the same house, the same community. And my younger of my two daughters said, mom, let's move to Paris. And it was sort of like having her spray down or move to Paris. You know, what was my choice? So I opted for move to Paris <laughs> Good idea. And, and trusting my intuition, trusting my spirit, which I have always been out in the world teaching people just along with her, we packed our bags and in a matter of really three months here we were. So it was like, a brand new, not only a brand new environment, it was a brand new, you know, template. It was a blank template. I I had my identity. I was over my old identity. Everything changed. And I had to start over. I had to start finding who I was going to be in this new city, new identity, new me. And it was a 
very challenging process. Well, and that's what I appreciate about the book, your memoir, is that you're honest with us. You tell us some of these struggles and you, I mean, <laughs> I, mean just, yeah. I won't, I won't share, share or spoil too much for the to the readers or the listeners, but I mean, the one with the stairs and, and, and your <laughs> hair, I mean, you walk us the through The hair and the eyebrows, oh, just <laughs> a lot. <laughs> but this is a beautiful book about reinvention or transformation. As you said, you had to start something new. You had to start a, a new chapter and it's consistently a theme. And I know there are listeners out there right now who have a desire to reinvent their lives, but they don't exactly feel like they know how. And one of the lessons, and there are many throughout this book that you share, is that quote, outside mirrors the inside. What do you, right. what do you mean by this? And how, how can understanding this concept help in someone's reinvention? Well, it was so interesting because the day before I moved to Paris was the first terrorist attacks that Paris had experienced in a long time with Charlie Hebdo. And it was like the city blew apart. And I just was like, everybody called me and said, you can't go, you can't go. It's it's like, well, they're blowing apart. I'm blowing apart. It's a perfect place to go. <laughs> You know, it's outside mirrors the inside, you know, they have to also reinvent themselves. So I trust that it's exactly where I need to be. So it started out that way. And just, I really had to get clear, you know, I spent 30 years with someone and allowed my life to develop in a way that accommodated creating a life with someone else that. I realized once we were we were not together how many parts of me I had carved away that that maybe wanted to resurrect and so things like he was the cook I started out liking to cook but turned it over to him so just had to go learn the basics from how to shop and how to pick the right things and 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 then how to, you know, I didn't know who I was. So was I going to be French now? <laughs> when I, the book certainly talks about that adventure and how I wholeheartedly was willing to give it a go. Right. But basically where it was difficult in my outer world mirrored where I needed to grow in my inner world. That was what was important. Well, and so I think that's, that's a good takeaway. It's where, okay, so if this is hard for me, then maybe that's where I need to step into more. I need to actually feel that uncomfortableness. Is that what you're kind of saying? Exactly. And one of the things I've written about in other books of mine, my teacher, Charlie, was a really great teacher. And he said, whatever scares you most, go there first. Mm-hmm. And if there is ever anything I learned that I am grateful for in the last few years of not just reinventing myself, but really becoming who I really want to be today, it was that piece of advice. Instead of running away and staying comfortable, lean into the fire and give it your all. So instead of trying to accommodate my old life or try to duct tape it together and say, this is fine, do something dramatically different that that I'd often thought about anyway, you know, go to where it's scary and trust you'll find your way. Trust you'll find your way. Now, how did Paris come about? I mean, I know you've traveled there before. I know that you went to the Sorbonne. Um, What was it about Paris that your daughter immediately said this or Paris? (laughs) What was that? Well, first of all, the thing about Paris is it's a feminine city. And what I needed to heal was my broken feminine heart. I needed to to heal the part of me that needed to self-love, to feel beautiful, to trust my intuition fully, even when it was painfully difficult. And I needed an outside that mirrored a beauty that I had lost touch with inside. And that's definitely what I got here. Paris is so beautiful and so exciting and so unpredictable that it prevented me from getting lost in my sorrows of the past. 
Well, and I love that Paris does play a very significant role. You talk about how the city, as you just said, helped you heal and helped you step into this new chapter. You state in the book that, quote, beautiful flowers, beautiful food were essential in Paris. A delicious meal was the heart of Paris life. I even read once that French people spend an average of seven hours a week eating meals together, while Americans spend an average of two. There was nothing fast about food here. It was another basic of life that people savored. What, if you could dive into more about what culture in Paris enabled you to find your equilibrium and feel more at peace. You speak, speak about the feminine aspect. Well, what do you, the you one thing, yeah, I just love that question because the one thing I am still appreciative of and very aware of is that I came here, I ran here. Mm-hmm. I was in full on fight or flight and Paris forced me into a dead stop, you know, slow down. There was nothing fast about this city that does not multitask. (laughs) It doesn't. And I was forced to be present, to be patient, to open my eyes and not postpone my happiness to what was going to come next, Mm, but to actually look around and say, if I'm going to be happy, it's going to be right now. Right now, I'm going to be happy with what is happening right now, whether it's waiting in line at the market while the woman in front of me is asking so many questions, you think she's, you know, applying for an adoption or, you know, she's just buying apples and, and just just slow down, slow down. And, and be in a new rhythm that isn't racing for tomorrow as where the happiness or the reward lies. And that has definitely allowed me a level of peace and contentment once I surrendered that I I really savor. As you just said, you had to be present. You had to be there. One part of being present is that you have to be very comfortable with your own company. And you share that your daughter, while she was there for about a year with you in Paris, she eventually moves on. Sabrina does to London. And you share, and I think this is a beautiful and very honest quote from a mother. And I want to share this And then I'd like you to respond. Um, You state, I was shocked at how deeply upset and overwhelmed I was by her leaving, especially since I was genuinely happy for her and knew in my heart and spirit that was absolutely what she must do. How important is it to have a healthy support system? And as well, how important is it for you to be able to stand on your own? Boy, that was the hardest part. You know, it's one thing to come with your buddy and we're in this together and we're we're, we're co-suffering together (laughs) because Sabrina had moved here, having broken up with a long-term partner as well. And when she left, I really realized that the real lesson of being here was both two things, finding a real peace in my own company And opening myself, because I'm an introvert, you know, people wouldn't know that because I stand up in front of thousands of people and do workshops and have a blast with people, but it's not the private intimate moments. So it also made me realize I depended so much on my husband to create the support system for me as a family. And I had to start doing that for myself. But the exciting part was that I got to start picking people, finding people who spoke to who I was today. Mm. When I got married, I was 20. I was young. I was not developed as a woman. I was not developed even as an author, anything. I was not developed, period. <laughs> and over the years, the, the, the self I had become was creative and artistic and 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 expressive and I got to build friends around those identities that I realized the support system I had left didn't particularly resonate with me okay. because they were developed earlier in my life. They weren't authentic necessarily to who you were. Now. So I had outgrown them. Absolutely. You know, we outgrow self ourselves and we need to keep opening up to the self we are becoming and letting go of aspects of us that weren't illegitimate we just they're no longer representative of who we are 
I think that's a great reminder to all of us is that just because something isn't working now doesn't mean it wasn't helpful. Um, to, to that point, your quote about your, your divorce, and you shared this earlier, but I thought this was very honest as well. Early in the book, you say, I hadn't made a mistake. The divorce wasn't a failure. It was just a destined ending. And it was simply time for my journey to continue in a different direction. Why is it important for us to understand this truth with regards to factors and moving forward? Well, I think that we tend to still be a very idealistic, patriarchal culture, but we're changing. Men and women are changing, and and we look at sometimes, and I just struggled through this. I wrote about it that, was it a failure? But I knew emotionally and, and egoistically, was it a failure? What? It, but on a soul level, no, it was just done. It was just done. My, it was just done. He had to go one way and I had to go one way to fulfill our soul evolution. That did not make it easy. <laughs> that did not make it easy. But it gave me a level of support on a deep soul level to keep me from being tormented by my ego, which could, which would easily say you messed up. Or he messed up or someone, you know, someone was to blame. Right. So you kind of set and yourself it, free and, and by letting that end peacefully. Be real. Yeah. Yeah. I set myself free because I knew on a soul level this was correct, yeah. but hard. I want to take an intermission right here at this point in our conversation because as she just talks about, a lot of what she's doing is not easy. And after our sponsor introduces itself, she's going to come back and talk about how to dance in the fire of pain and why it's absolutely necessary, as well as share where she is now in her journey. There's a few other things she's going to talk about, and I think you're going to find them very helpful. I know I really appreciated her talking about them. She's going to talk about why it's important to not put yourself last and talk about what has softened her and reminds her daily that everything is going to be okay. That's in the second half of our conversation. But first, let me introduce you to today's sponsor. Furniture shopping is often a struggle. You want something that looks great and will last, but you don't want to spend $5,000 on a sofa. Plus, let's be real, you don't need bulky, oversized furniture that requires movers just to get it in the door, let alone upstairs. The founder of Campaign felt exactly the same way. So he built a company made for people like us. Campaign makes sofas, chairs, love seats, and ottomans that are built to last. Everything they sell is made using quality materials like a steel frame that comes with a lifetime guarantee. Campaign's furniture arrives in just a few days in a flat packed box, so you don't have to schedule a delivery and wait around for it. Each piece is also made to assemble in just a few minutes, and you don't even need any tools to set it up. My favorite part is that they offer easy to remove covers so you can change the look of your home of your home without having to buy a new sofa. It also means that if you have a kid, get a new puppy, or have a fantastic dinner party, you can wash the covers or easily replace them. So why not check out campaignliving.com to see the goods? And there is a special deal for the simple, sophisticated listeners. Save $75 off any sofa, loveseat, or chair when you use the code TSS at checkout. That's campaignliving.com, C-A-M-P-A-I-G-N, living. Dot com and use the code TSS to save $75 off your order. All right, we're going to get right back into our conversation and talk about creating that social network when we move to a new town or, in Sonia's case, a new country. The hard part, I think, when we do start a new chapter, and you exemplify this as well in your book, is now you're starting to create a new community and a new network here in Paris. Paris is an entirely new city to you. And I really appreciate your honesty on this as well. You say, that you really didn't have a lot of social connections in Paris for that first year or so. I mean, Sabrina was there with you, but when she left, that's when you realized, wow, I need more of these. Yeah, I was alone. Can you speak to that? Because a lot of us out there, we, we, we were, we're, we're courageous enough to go someplace new. But the daunting part is after the newness wears off, after the excitement wears off, we have to build a community. And that's something that doesn't happen overnight. Can you walk us through no, that? No, yeah. that was definitely probably the biggest um, shocker. <laughs> like, <laughs> these people don't know me. 
I don't know them. And the thing that's interesting, especially about France, is unlike America, it's not Mm community-oriented. It's family-oriented. So bringing in strangers, bringing in and bonding as adults on a new level is is a new phenomena here. Okay. So it was like, where do I begin? Because usually I made friends through my kids' school. I made friends in the neighborhood. I made friends with, you know, from that I grew up with. But here it was zero. I had none of those constructs, which I thought was a really good spiritual tool for me to see, to consciously choose who I wanted to be around. It was a bit hit and miss, but I began to get out of my comfort zone. And do things that I would normally not do, like go to a meetup group, for example, mm-hmm. and 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 just be among a bunch of strangers around a new topic, and and you know take a cooking class, and and go visit a, a church, and I mean it was all, and yoga class, and it was all exceedingly uncomfortable. How do you but ultimately that? successful. I was going to say it's very successful. How do you balance the uncomfortableness? Because you, for everyone's different, but I, for me, I find that there's a certain amount of uncomfortable feelings that I can handle before I need some comfort. How did you balance that? I definitely had again a good teacher, and he's saying when you're un- when you when you are uncomfortable, you're growing. Ah, okay. So I always was willing to frame it as a good thing even though it wasn't a pleasant thing. <laughs> so I was, I have a high uncomfortable tolerance, okay. clearly, but I was, and I was glad for that part of me that could, and the, you know, the biggest thing that I learned here as, a, as someone who one learned to be extremely self-reliant was educated to be a caretaker of others was by nature an intuitive hyper, you know, aware of the needs of others. I learned to ask for help. Mm. And that was part of my balance here is learning to say, I'm new here. Anybody want to go for coffee? Uh. And that's just not something. I grew up in a family of seven. I married a man who was the the oldest of nine. I moved into a neighborhood that was very, and you know, close. I was never alone in my life. This was new, and I'm so grateful that I got to learn to ask for help. Well, and one of your friends that you you strike a quite a, a good friendship with is Marion Ross. And she, she, you share a quote that you and her talk about. And I want to share this because you clearly have very similar backgrounds. You're both writers. You're both spending par- time in Paris or living in Paris. She part-time, but they, you talk about what Paris does to that authentic self of you basically ask you to be authentic. She says it is intense to live in Paris, but ha- but it is worth it because you become more authentic the longer you stay. Paris has no tolerance for or patience with anything fake or cheap or ugly. And that includes what is inside of you as well. I love this quote. And you say, I believe that that is the secret gift of Paris and the real reason it casts such a spell on people all over the world. It demands that you recognize and insist on the most beautiful version of life inside and out. And this is a great analogy. Like polishing a diamond, living in Paris casts off the shadow and forces your true light to shine. And the process hurts. <laughs> it, I, it's, it's so hurts. true. Yeah. Can you explain why it's necessary to, to hurt, I guess? Well, Paris is not sentimental. <laughs> so, for example, if you're speaking to someone in, in Paris, they will correct your French without any hesitation. If you don't say, I I remember in, I was uh, out to dinner once and I asked for water and the guy next to me said, s'il vous plaît. (laughs) And I I hadn't even got to the please part yet. I was still struggling with the, est-ce que je peux avoir de l'eau? And he had to hop in there to make sure. And I thought, you know, he's trying to make me beautiful. My ego is, who the hell do you think you are? But his motive was to make me beautiful. 
that was a beautiful way to request something. And yet what's hard is your ego has to step aside and can't, cannot take it as any sort of a challenge to, to, to my, my way of doing things. How dare you challenge my way of doing things? So I was grateful, humbled beyond humbled, (laughs) but grateful because I was clear enough to know never was the motive to humiliate me. It was always the motive. I go into a try a dress on that doesn't look good on you. (laughs) Very direct. Well, thanks for sharing, but (laughs) it's accurate. You need to look beautiful. Okay. It's tough love for sure. And if we, I think that's a wonderful observation is if we stop fighting it, our ego stops getting in the middle of it, then we actually right. save a lot of energy and we embrace it and learn and move forward. And and then you develop a tremendous sense of humor. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> you do. You do. You know, it's like when you go to restaurants and they have a special, they'll say, La petite salade du moment, which means the little salad of the moment. Oh, okay. And it's a pretty, it's a, it's a cute little analogy of like in this very moment, there's something very beautiful you could have. Tomorrow's moment will be different. Mm. So in, and it's like, oh, I would just laugh at du moment <laughs> of the moment. You know, let's make no assumptions here. Let's be present. <laughs> Enjoy it now. And and I've really taken that back out into the bigger world. I am more present wherever I go. I am slower and more mindful. And I eat and listen and, and observe with more depth and appreciation okay. for everyone everywhere. Because life isn't that easy sometimes. Right. Right. And I, I thank you for sharing all of this. I, I, I wanted, because I know a lot of us are sitting here listening and we're saying, wait a second, but do I have to move to Paris? And you reassure your readers that they don't have to move to Paris as you did. But for you, it was Paris. It needed to be Paris. And I think that's important to keep in mind. Everyone's town or city or place is going to be. Right. Paris. See, I think what I'm really saying at the end is no, it's not Paris, right. but choose to move to the to whatever circumstance, internal or external, will help bring out your the beautiful you that you are. You Don't just stay stuck in an identity or a circumstance or even a location that doesn't invite you to live your beautiful self full out. Thank you for sharing that. That's some great advice. Our surroundings are powerful. If I, I have a question. So if... if Someone says, well, I can't move now. I can't. I have a job. I have responsibilities here. For whatever reason, they can't move. What is it that they can look at in their life right now where they are and shift or or reconsider? I'd say the first thing is shift your identity. Okay. Don't say I'm a nurse. I'm a doctor. I'm a teacher. Those are things you do. Okay. I'm divorced. I'm not divorced. Those are circumstances outside of you. Say I'm a, I'm a creative spirit. And what parts of my creative spirit are yearning to express that I've surrendered to accommodate my life? Maybe I surrendered learning a language. Maybe I surrendered allowing myself to be a more colorful dresser. Maybe I surrendered, you know, the ability to go to the life theater. Maybe I surrendered making friends in in new circumstances and I can go to a meetup here. I can try a cooking class there. I can go, go take a course at the local community college to, to resurrect parts of me that are still there in seed form. In seed form. I love it. Well, and you say that, you say that transformation is always a messy affair and it can be slow. So have patience with ourselves. In other words, with this process. Oh, absolutely. I would say the first two years of living here between what I had to solve inside plus what was going on outside plus all the changes was extremely painful, but wonderful. Painful in that I was staying attached to what needed to go. 
painful in that I was afraid of the unknown, painful in that I was facing parts of me that I didn't have confidence Mm. would take care of me. Mm. And I found that it, that I did could find those resources. So I don't want us to measure progress with, is it pain free? Okay. Because that sometimes keeps us trapped and comfortable in things that no longer serve us. Okay. That's, that's definitely some words that we can absolutely keep reminding ourselves of. Pain is not a bad thing to step towards. Under the right, right. You know, it, it, we, we sometimes need to have that experience for a greater version of ourselves and to not judge ourselves if we are in pain to be failures because I think especially in America, we're very, we're very black and white and can be very judgmental and blamey. And, and we can very much, especially even in the new age genre and the, you know, self-help genre, we can, you, we can misuse the, the, and have the illusion that a spiritual life equals pain-free life. And I wrote, I really emphasize that is not accurate. Life has moments of pain because it has endings. Mm. So it's not about avoiding pain. It's about dancing in the fire of pain and finding your essence. Okay. And if there are endings, there must be beginnings. And I have to ask, how are your beginnings going now after these two years? Well, it's just been, it, it, I'm in probably the happiest period of my life right now. In fact, my two, old, my daughters, including Sabrina, I had a vacation with my two daughters last week in Lisbon and they both said at dinner, we don't think we've ever seen you happier in our entire life, oh, that's wonderful. which was such a good thing to hear. And I said, you know, I feel that's probably true because there's nothing about my life right now that doesn't really support and reflect who I am. I have made some wonderful friends. I have found and created a home that's super comfortable. And I love myself in a way that isn't at the back of the love bus, which it was before. I see. Okay. You put yourself as a priority to self-love for self-love. Right. You know, I always loved other people and was, and still really do, but I came last and now I, I'm, I come first because I can love more and more authentically with no secret agendas. Yeah. No secret expectations of I loved you, now you owe me one. Right. And that feels good. It was worth that. Ah. Thank you for sharing that one because I think that's huge. We need to get beyond that because that's a, that's an example of, in, in my definition of insecurity. If we think we give something and we're gonna get something in return, that's us seeking something that we shouldn't have. Then we don't really consciously negotiate that, but I know in my marriage I certainly plenty of times thought, you know, I'm just such a wonderful person. You owe me one. (laughs) Yeah. And that was definitely a memo that my ex-husband did not get and didn't (laughs) sign on for. And I've learned that was not fair. Yeah. Yeah. And I I needed to be clear about what I was giving and doing things for. And that was an implied agreement. I wasn't that conscious of. Okay. It's unconscious. That's very honest. I think a lot of us get into that, mis- make that mistake. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm loving my my American in Paris life. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing well. I mean, I'm following you on Instagram, and I just you just radiate your sincere happiness. <laughs> I appreciate that. I really love it. I, can tell. I really love my new life, and encourage anybody who's afraid. To go for it. To go for it. Well, I think your our conversation here has definitely mm-hmm. offered some inspiration. But before we wrap up, Sonia, I want to give you the opportunity as a guest of today's podcast, our, our episode, to share a petite plaisir or a simple pleasure that you enjoy in your every days. My greatest pleasure is I keep fresh flowers in my house that smell really good. And the first half hour of my day is my delicious cup of coffee with cream, not milk, 
sitting with my flowers. I never did that. And I love it. Really? Good for you. Every day. That's fantastic. And it is really those simple things that can really set the tone for a beautiful day. Yeah, it really has changed me. It softened me. It just was like, it's okay. You can just, everything's okay. Just be here. It's all okay. It's all okay. And, and I just encourage everybody to find that one same simple, nobody gets to intrude, rush, be part of, just, just be for you, joy. Find that moment in your days. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's my pleasure, Shannon. Thank you. I'm really, really honored that you asked me on. Thank you. Absolutely. Listeners, you can learn more about Sonia's class offerings and all of her books online at soniachoquette.net. And if you are looking for a book to offer inspiration for reinvention and heeding your authentic self through the journey of Sonia's firsthand experience of moving and making Paris her home, be sure to check out her book, Waking Up in Paris, Overcoming Darkness in the City of Light, available now. I want to thank Sonia for joining me on today's podcast episode, and thank you for tuning in um, as we kick off the Simply Luxurious Life annual French Week. I know that the quality of the audio wasn't um, as as awesome as it normally is, and we always can make improvements. Um, I'm having to, to transition between a few things because of upgrades and updates to new systems, so thank you for your patience with that. I am working on that. Today, I'd also like to share with you we're just about ready to start season five of the podcast. We kicked off the Simple Sophisticate back in September 2014, and we are wrapping up four years, as you already know, 221 episodes of you guys tuning in, talking about living simply luxuriously, talking about truly tapping into our most authentic selves and slowing down and listening and making sure that our life is full of that quality over quantity. And it's going to be different for every single one of us, which is why it is, is there's not a specific formula. And that's why I love bringing guests on the show when we have the opportunity, because we see that everyone's doing it a little bit differently. Everyone has a different journey. But I also hear a lot of similar themes as they talk about this listening, this, as Sonia talked about, slowing down. I love her petit plaisir and the reminder that how we construct our everydays makes a tremendous difference over the quality of our everyday and thus our life. So I'm excited to bring on more guests to do exactly that, talk about their unique journey so that every one of us can find a bit of inspiration because we'll all grab on probably something a little bit different. All right, with regards to season five, we'll be starting that on the 3rd of September. We have two more episodes of season four. We're gonna change things up a little bit for season five, so stay tuned as to what that's going to look like. I'll be talking about that more in the final two episodes of season four, which will be next Monday and the following Monday. And to give a heads up as to what the next two episodes are about, they're about getting back into the groove of work, of school. We're going to talk about that checklist. And one episode is going to be entirely dedicated to the French concept of returning from that summer holiday in August, whether you're a student, whether you're a parent, whether you're simply a vacationer who was away from work and now getting back into your work schedule, la rentrée. All right, stay tuned for that over the next two weeks, but we still have an entire week of the French week. And that means that every single day from yesterday, the 12th of August to the 19th of August, you will find at least, at least two new posts on the blog, the Simply Luxurious Life. Dot com, and that is also where you can find the show notes and the links to Sonia Choquette's book, Waking Up in Paris, the Simply Luxurious Life.com slash podcast 221. All right, I will see you next week. Have a wonderful week, and thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. For more ideas and inspiration throughout the week, stop by the blog, the Simply Luxurious Life.com, or pre order Living the Simply Luxurious Life, Making Your Every Day's Extraordinary and Discovering Your Best Self, which will be released on November 13th, 2018. You can also pick up my first book, Choosing the Simply Luxurious Life, a Modern Woman's Guide, which is now available in paperback as well as ebook and audio version. 
versions on Audible, iTunes, and Amazon, or wherever ebook and audiobooks are sold. To stay caught up on the most recent episodes of the podcast, blog post, and to receive exclusive news as well as an extra dose of inspiration to jumpstart your weekend, subscribe to the Simply Luxurious Life's weekly newsletter, which arrives in your inbox each Friday to enjoy with a hot cup of tea or a morning cup of coffee. Until next Monday, I'm your host, Shannon Abels. Bonjour. Bonjour.